Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. And today we have two great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, I prevented the whole office from working because I was called to work when I was sick. The second story, new HR rep tried to save the company $500 and ends up costing it $12,000 and peeves the employees off. And the first story is, true asthma attack malicious compliance. I have asthma, always have. Now there are varying degrees of asthma. The worst is considering having asthmaticus. Essentially, this means the following. I would have an asthma attack two or more times a year. These attacks would result in hospital stays at a young age. I was provided a nebulizer to use at home, and I also had one which stayed in the nurse's office. Now since my youth I've grown to the point where my asthma is more controlled, and with proper meds, I seldom wheeze now or have an episode. Thankfully my last full-blown asthma attack was over a year ago, and only stirs when I'm ill with upper respiratory issues. Think the flu, colds, etc. When you grow up with asthma, as you've already probably read in the other posts, you know when an episode is coming on. You know when it's getting worse, and you know when it's time to say, F it, I don't want to die, nebulizer time. I didn't have many issues with teachers growing up. My mom was on the PTA and was known throughout the schools I attended and was very much a helicopter parent. I didn't even think there could be issues with taking my meds until I was in my early 20s, working at a collections call center. We had a team lead we'll refer to as EB, entitled B. EB had a propensity to tell you what you were doing slash experiencing, and if you didn't do what she would do, how she would do it, then you were clearly doing it wrong. She was a micromanager like no other. She and I, I'm extremely stubborn when it comes to being micromanaged, had a few altercations. To put things in context, here are a few things we clashed on in the course of the first year I was there. We were allowed personal items to entertain ourselves while we worked. EB had the nerve and gumption to think that she was allowed and had the power to snatch anything she wanted and place it in her drawer, like we were five. I had a red stress ball I would juggle while working. One day while tossing it up not too high and catching it, she thought it would be a good idea to snatch it midair and walk it to her desk. I placed the call on hold, walked down the aisle, opened her drawer and took it back. I then took a picture frame from her desk and took it back to mine. She didn't have much of a leg to stand on when we spoke to the floor's VP later on. I got to keep my stuff. She would walk up to you mid-conversation and start talking behind you, leading what you were saying. The worst part of this is that the person on the phone could hear it. While most would comment on it, one day I decided to shift the entire convo with said person, over to the fact of how rudely she was behind me. I basically sat down, turned my chair to face her, and remarked to the person on the phone how yes, it is rude to interrupt our conversation. Why yes, we do have a good rapport. No, I would never ask you to pay that much up front. That would be asinine based upon what you've told me you're going through financially. Once again, she backed down. Now it was later in the year, and I ended up catching what turned out to be the flu. Most of the office did this year, but although I tried to work through it, I called in one morning while having an asthma attack. Now I don't know about everyone else with asthma, but this is how an asthma attack works for me. It's not that you can't breathe in, you can't breathe out. It takes a ton of focus and effort to push the air in your lungs out, so you can inhale a full breath of air. This is worsened by the fact of you're always being constricted by your overactive bronchial tubes, and made even worse when you're already lightheaded, and coughing fit can lead you to dang near passing out. What it sounds like? Imagine having just run until you can't breathe anymore. Now add a cough that won't let you inhale all the way. That's how you sound on the phone. I left a message on the call in line and took another treatment. The attack started after work the previous day, so I'd been up mostly all night taking treatments every four hours. I was exhausted, ill, and short-fused. This is where EB decided to contact me and inform me that she didn't see my asthma as that debilitating, and I needed to be in the office within 10 minutes, as she knew how close I lived. Now arguing while having an asthma attack is terrible and try as I may, she just kept cutting me off, happy that she could get a word in edgewise with me unable to really talk back as she put it. So I capitulated. I got up, put on whatever was close by, and slowly made my way to work. It took longer than the 10 minutes allotted, but I had to pack my meds and nebulizer, and I didn't pack the new compact one, no, no. I packed my boy blue. As I said earlier, I've had asthma since I was born, so I have multiple nebulizers, but good old blue is the oldest. This 10-pound beige block of plastic is a one-foot cube with the loudest air pump in it that I owned. Not only was it loud, but it shook like a $400 women's magic wand. Old Blue is a marvel of late 1970s, early 1980s nebulizer engineering. However, in the mid-2000s, it was a massive gigantic noise, making vibration machine that had no place anywhere near an office. I walked in looking like death. Walked past EB with her SH-eating grin and sat down at my desk like a good boy. As you can imagine, the first two hours on the phone were god-awful. 
I could barely reply to anything and spent much of the time at my desk checking my fever, taking meds and waiting, cause I had my ace. Right before the 4 hour mark when I could no longer afford to wait, I broke out old blue. I had it in a duffel bag I sometimes carried to work. All the people next to me just stared while I sat up at this goliath of a machine. Filled in my meds, put the mouthpiece in my mouth, and hit start on a double treatment. Imagine being at your desk. Imagine being right near closing that big commission making deal when this starts. And this is quiet. Old Blue shook the pens off of my desk and the one on the other side of the wall it was touching. Everyone with an earshot had to hit mute. I essentially stopped two or three teams of 40 people from being able to work. Not only did the teams hear it, EB heard it, and so did the VP. EB walked over and tried to ask me to turn it off, but I just stared at her. See, you shouldn't talk whilst taking your treatment. This is a waste. Waste not, want not. Suffice to say, it didn't take the VP more than five minutes to say I could go home, but I had to finish my treatment or I wouldn't be able to drive home. So there I sat mid-call center floor, on Old Blue for the next 20 minutes. I was able to breathe a little better, thank the VP and went on home for the next three days. My attacks always have lasted three days of suck and one day of recovery. When I got back to work, the VP apologized for EB's behavior. He informed me she had been reprimanded and forced to take a sensitivity class and a managerial course. Also, I'd been bumped up to another team with a more chill manager we'll call AM for awesome manager. EB never spoke to me again, but no one ever questioned whether or not I was sick again either. All MC with no hospital. Win-win. The second story is... Try to become our boss? Screw over employees and order us to follow our contract exactly how it's written? Let's see how this works out. Before the company was sold and then driven into the ground by the new owners, I worked as a patrol supervisor for a high-end security company. Now let's explain some things that are relevant to the story. Only supervisors got salary. Our normal working week was 48 hours. Anything over that, we got hour for hour paid time off in lieu of a normal vacation. Our contract stated that if a supervisor worked any position that wasn't as the supervisor on duty, they were to be paid an hourly rate based on their average hourly salary rate. Contract stated two more important things, that the company can buy paid time off for 85% or more of its value if the employee agrees. Said employee can also offer to sell it back for any amount. Two, contracts are valid for one year. If the employer wants to renegotiate before that time, the employer has to pay so much for each month the contract is still valid for. Employment contract is basically a list of rules and conditions. Instead of the contract saying that you got paid time off or an hourly rate, it said we got both. So legally we were entitled to both, or we could sue the company, and if one got all that money, own to us. Plus more, and the company would be fine. Not the exact phrasing. It's been a while, but you get the idea. For clarity, we're five months into our current contract at the time. Now the owner, I'll call John, was awesome. He expected a lot, but he treated everyone well. Gave his supervisors almost free reign made sure officers had the best equipment to protect themselves, and was generally just a good guy. So we didn't give him much flack over little things. Now we asked for and he gave the supervisors a discretionary fund for our officers. On most nights we had on call officer, some nights we didn't. If we needed to call someone in, we could say, hey, come in and work and I'll buy you lunch. Or, you want to come in but don't have the gas to get to your region and back? Meet me at this gas station and I'll buy you some gas. Little things to keep the supervisors from having to work regions and do our jobs. Plus, it made everyone happy. Normal cost was around $450 to $500, but saved the company thousands. He wanted a low turnover company and found ways to keep experienced people applying and staying with the company. Enter the new HR rep, Mary. Well, she calls a meeting with us supervisors. She has something she needs to discuss, so the next morning me and my fellow two supervisors show up. On the table was an end to the discretionary fund. It cost the company too much, she said, and stuck to it after us explaining how it saved money. Also, without going into specifics, we had to work exactly like our employment contract stated. No deviating. Also, any requests for promoting among the officers needed to be approved by her, which to her they were just a payroll number, and a bunch of other things designed to put herself between us and John and became our boss. Now, none of us had ever really read the whole contract, so at the end we went over it without her. Turns out there are loopholes we could drive a truck through, but legally valid. Now, we could have taken this to John, but we knew he would say to give it a chance, so we did. Seeing we were salary, our pay period was monthly, 30 days instead of weekly. We also knew John didn't read certain emails or payroll until the end of the month, so we set out to do exactly as she asked, stick to the contract. So we each worked our 48 hours and other days of the week. I ended up working 24 days out of that month. My normal 48 hours as a supervisor, plus an additional 24 to 36 hours a week as a regional patrol officer. Mostly because without our fund, it was getting almost impossible to get people to come in on their days off. So we split it up, but I did the majority. 
so we submitted a form for our not only paid time off for those extra shifts, but a pay request for hourly for each extra shift, which for me was $18.75 an hour for each one. I never went into hourly overtime for the week. At the end of 27 days, I accumulated over 100 hours of paid time off from the extra shifts and going overtime on my supervisor shifts. John was added to the email also, but the subject was end of the month forms, which means he wouldn't read them until the end of the month to verify the ones Mary gave him were correct. In other words, we double dipped like a son of a bee that month. Now fast forward 27 days after the meeting and John sends us an email stating he was aware of the situation and scheduled a meeting for 8 a.m. the next day. We get in there and he doesn't look happy, but Mary looks smug, so we got worried it might backfire until John started and basically it went like this. Gentlemen, Mary told me about your meeting. She didn't discuss it with me first or I would have stopped it. I also know if you would have came to me, I would have said to try it out. Also, HR will never be in charge of the supervisors. You work for me and me alone. So, holds up three envelopes and hands them out. Here's your hourly pay for being region officers this month. Your normal pay comes at the normal time. Also, hands out another envelope to each of us. This is my attempt to buy back all your paid time off you've gained this month at 90%. If you don't accept, give me this check back. None of us did. Now here's another check each for the contract buyout, and I will have a new one ready in the morning. I've also refilled and reactivated the cards for your discretionary fund. So use it as needed, and if you run out before the end of the month, email me. He then looks over at Mary and says, So Mary, how much did your idea save the company? Mary, $500, John. John replies, No, Mary, it cost the company $1,200. That's what those checks totally. Sure, SpongeBob got the lion's share, but the man is a work animal. It still cost me $12,000. Then Mary said something that I'm sure she got fired for. She said, come on, John, it's just words on a piece of paper and not really legally binding. Besides, the use of loopholes in a contract is illegal. That got us all staring at her. We may not have attended business school, but we're smart enough to know she was not only wrong, but dead wrong. Yeah, the next day, John sent out an email saying the position was open and anyone interested to send in their resumes. P.S. The only charges to our contract was adding that we could get PTO or our hourly rate. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.